Hi, welcome to tonight's first installment of Rice and Resistance, a discussion series focused on anti-capitalist and anti-authoritarian political movements across South Asia. As an organization, Salam aims to work with other South Asian and internationalist organizations to address the consequences of uneven development as they manifest in ongoing fascism, deepening economic crises, casteism, religious fundamentalism, ethno-nationalism, and patriarchy. Today's panel discussion is about the ongoing crisis in Sri Lanka and will focus on the uprisings against the corruption of the ruling regime and the impending restructuring of the island's economy. My name is Simi Katagama. I am a freelance reporter based in New York. And tonight I will be moderating tonight's panel as well as the question and answer session that will follow. Sri Lanka is undergoing a harrowing series of transformations. The government of Gotabaya Rajapaksa has sparked national outrage due to self-serving economic mismanagement, which has culminated in skyrocketing prices of essential goods like fuel and food and a complete default of Sri Lanka's external debt, which currently sits at over 50 billion US dollars in total. The poorest people in the country have been living on a single meal a day, if that, and access to essential and costly imports is dwindling. Protests have sprung up across the country, only to be met with violence from the government. And while Rajapaksa corruption and brutality have been defining aspects of Sri Lanka's history since 2005, not all of Sri Lanka's ills can be blamed on this political dynasty. Following the end of Sri Lanka's nearly 30 year civil war in 2009, then President Mahinda Rajapaksa, Gotabaya's brother, consolidated power by using the country's military and terror tactics, and did this in order to entrench supremacist sentiment amongst the country's majority Sinhalese community. He did this by doubling down on stigmatizing Tamil and Muslim minorities. Throughout their reign of terror, during which journalists and dissenters were disappeared or were killed, the Rajapaksas put forward many development projects, such as new highways and a notorious port city that were funded using foreign loans. They also used this massive influx of outside capital to enrich themselves. This deepened reliance on costly imports, a tendency that dates back to Sri Lanka's time as a British colony, it also solidified Sri Lanka's dependence on remittances from migrant workers traveling abroad and tourism. Both of these were badly hurt by COVID and the recent war between Russia and Ukraine. Grain and fertilizer from those countries became an important part of Sri Lanka's food systems, as with many other parts of the global south. Moreover, both Russians and Ukrainians were a major source of tourism income. Just as government crackdowns and anti-minority attacks from mobs began their recent spike, Sri Lanka began discussions with the International Monetary Fund, an architect of Sri Lanka's dependence on imports and antagonist to the country's famed social welfare system. Despite having historically been a low-income country, Sri Lanka has been able to maintain high levels of human development by offering such services as free education, healthcare, public transportation subsidies, caps on pharmaceutical prices, and food relief. The IMF as an international body offers poorer countries debt reduction only on the basis of their privatizing services like those and reducing institutions that provide relief from poverty. Compliance with IMF policy began hollowing out Sri Lanka's essential services back in the 1970s. And despite the ongoing reality of COVID-19, the organization appears unwilling to shift from these austerity prescriptions. Tonight's guest will further elaborate on the situation. Each one will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, Jude Fernando, a scholar, activist, and journalist, will lead us in a structural overview of Sri Lanka's development situation. Specifically, how the Rajapaksa's ban on imported fertilizer shocked Sri Lanka's food system and kicked off the current crisis. He will be followed by Kalpa Rajapaksa, who is not in any way related to the ruling regime. Um, Kalpa is working on a dissertation in political economy at the New School. He teaches in Sri Lanka 
and will provide an on the ground view of the uprisings. His protest photography will be featured after our speaking program, which will be concluded by an analysis from Nianthony Kazakdama. Nianthony is a researcher and PhD student in international education. Tonight, she will lay out uh, the threat posed by the IMF to Sri Lanka's education and welfare systems. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge why Vimukti De Silva could not be here tonight. As a farm worker organizer, she was attacked as part of pro Rajapaksa backlash. Her assailants used her dark skin as a pretext to lob anti Tamil slurs. We wish her a speedy recovery and demand an end to this repressive violence. I want to say to our guests, thank you so much for your contributions. I want to shout out tonight's co sponsors, including Haymarket Books, South Asian Americans Leading Together, South Asia Solidarity Initiative, Internationalism from Below, Boricua Resistance, Anak Bayan, and CISPES. We'll hear more from them after the program, but for now, Jude can take us away. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, um, I'm speaking actually without, I don't have a written script. I just finished grading uh, <laughs> literally 75 papers. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, so uh, I think one of the interesting thing that we learn from this uprising is that it has really uh, sort of revealed the material basis of uh, the identity politics or the racist ethnic nationalism in Sri Lanka in a way that is undisputed. Right? Um, for a long time, the regime really survived or, or drew its legitimacy from the racist nationalism, which really distracted the public. Uh, and the people also very critical of identity politics uh, didn't really sort of, they saw it, but they didn't really sort of, uh, uh, sort of paid much attention to the economics of this uh, identity politics. Right? Uh, but even then, even today, uh, there are interpretations of the movement, uh, which are basically trying to argue that this is an unsystemic movement, this is purely a political movement. I mean, those representations are there, but still it is the material uh, realities, hardships that drives the, uh, the, the people to join the movement. Even though as time goes on, we might not see the connection, right? Uh, we might not see, this connection is there, but we might not see the popular media. Now, uh, to illustrate this, let me... Uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the uh, fertilizer crisis. That is a very good illustration, right? Uh, because the way that we think about it is not, I think, what it is, right? So the whole idea was that the government suddenly imposed a ban on chemical fertilizer. Now, the argument was that the chemical fertilizer is prim primarily responsible for uh, kidney diseases and also bad human health. That was the argument, right? So, so I mean, on the surface, it appears to be a, a desirable goal, right? You can't dispute that. But then there's a lot that went background and after they imposed the ban and then uh, uh, later it led to a series of crises. And I think that's one of the fundamental drivers of this conflict. So that led to the crisis, uh, basically here, the conflict, right? So uh, now, this idea of turning organic, when the, or when the president Rajapaksha sort of imposed this ban on chemical fertilizer, a lot of people said that he's not pragmatic. Um, he must listen to the experts. The reason why he's failing was that he didn't listen to the experts or all willing to learn from the experience of other countries uh, that, that tried to sort of uh, convert into uh, organic uh, farming. Uh, and also, some people said that that everything that happened because of very narcissistic kind of beliefs, he was looking for a way to legitimize his regime at a time the regime was in crisis, right? So that was the kind of the argument, right? So this notion of pragmatic, if that had it been pragmatic, it would have worked. Or had if not, had he listened to uh, experts and the farmers, it would have worked. And we know that he defied all advice and he was determined to do it. Now, I think we have to go beyond uh, the, 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 this kind of popular representation. There's much more deeper reality. Uh, that's what I have been uh, researching on uh, for a while. Uh, so if, if you look at the timing of this fertilizer ban, number of things were going on. A, agriculture sector is becoming unprofitable in a market sense. That's falling rate of profit. 
there was pressure on the government to convert the land from producing staple to crops that will have a higher export value or convert the land according to, according to competitive advantage in the market uh, in the international economy that pressure was there third factor is that when this ban was introduced the organic industry has become a global industry extremely profitable when i say industry it's all organic inputs like fertilizer and also organic uh, products consumer products now this organic industry as a global industry has a much longer history which really goes back to uh, the time when the when the us and the european firms were looking going into south american islands looking for guano or the bad poop as fertilizer in fact the search for organic fertilizer in order to address the issue of depletion of soil in european countries is one of the material basis for colonial interventions in countries to these countries to be colonized later right and the marx has written about this quite quite a bit right he has referred to gorno imperialism and etc et right so we had that long history but that time the the europeans were going into the developing countries looking for organic fertilizer to 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 address the issue of declining fertility in europe when the european agriculture was moving from small scale agriculture into industrial agriculture following the enclosure movements now then you have the development of uh, uh, synthetic fertilizer especially after the, uh, uh, the 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 world war 1 and world war 2 so that was the history of the past so there's a much longer history but this organic movement today is something different it's not so much uh, the 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 looking going into third world countries to uh gather organic material uh, fertilizer and bring it back to europe but it's a in way in which that these countries are global capital is trying to transform the productive systems in the developing countries according to organic demands of the organic market so it's something slightly different so the when this thing was happening as i said earlier to have this global industry are looking for markets markets for their fertilizer markets for their organic products so that was the cause. and then in that when this was happening in sri lanka there were 36 firms private firms are actively involved in producing organic crops i have the list of all the firms and these firms uh, included academics from the agriculture department uh, ngos some of the uh, and then the the various uh, experts from the develop, developing countries fair traders so the whole lot right and they were in, they were very active and then i i, I just I, I i followed the what actually they were up to what they do is that they 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 get all of the small farmers give them advice and then give them some little bit of capital and sometimes uh, a sort of uh, uh, material how to uh, do organic farming and they were really trying to get all these farmers to join into a network and the, and the connect the network with uh, the organic centers in developing developed countries now what was going on was that farmers were using their indigenous knowledge and the local practices do the farming that were extremely cost effective for the firms in fact they were mobilizing the local knowledge and the local uh, skills to produce organic product at a lower cost and all these farmers at the grassroots level get connected with the global capital for the global center they became in fact a global industry it's very interesting that this whole celebration of the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous uh, practices was a means to basically commodify the indigenous knowledge and then deprive the farmers of the, the of what they produce so the, so that was the kind of the background but then it's very difficult to see very clear connection between where the gotabe rajapaksha is putting pressure pressure on uh, sorry for this company is putting direct pressure on gota bay rajapaksha to uh, sort of uh, ban the chemical fertilizer and then uh, create conditions for uh, transition into organic uh, agriculture that connection is not there but these firms were behind the scene and then even that connection is not visible there was enough pressure on the policy maker to support the uh, agriculture companies that will produce 
products that are highly profitable in the impressional market. And they happen to be the organic products. So this was the kind of the background. Okay. Now then after the ban was introduced, number of things happened. There was a drop de decline in production. Farmers abandoned their lands. Land was transferred into uh, the hands of uh, the richer farmers who used the land to cultivate uh, long-term cash crops, organic or otherwise, but has a much more export for the market value, and also uh, into organic uh, uh, agriculture because the richer farmers could afford the organic fertilizer because they had additional land, they had cows, forget manure, and also they could purchase uh, uh, cow dung and waste other organic material from the others. So the small farmers got kicked out. So what was happening was that immediately after the organic, uh, the fertilizer ban was introduced, there was disposition of land and the conversion of land into products uh, to produce stuff that has a higher market value. Then mm -hmm. there was evidence, there is evidence of forced migration, ban of land. And then when that happened, who took the responsibility to, to, to basically the issue of food security, right? And then there was deforestation because people were to clear more land to do chain type of cultivation under the poorer so they can grow crops. And then who were one of the main most visible victims? Women. The men were trying to migrate and to find, find some kind of livelihood. And the women had to basically address the issue of food security at home. Right? And that was very, very clear in places like in the Buddhist. So all these consequences happen. And then there was something else was going on. Immediately this happened, both India and, and China was trying to enter into the, uh, the Sri Lankan agriculture mm -hmm. industry. They were trying to become the main suppliers of organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. The negotiation for between China and Sri Lanka, two minutes. Uh, no, you, you're you actually over time. Perhaps we can touch, I'll, I'll ask you to uh, come back to that in the question and answer. Okay, first. all right, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, Kalpa to be able to give us. Okay, sorry, uh, sir, I didn't see the time. Okay. No, 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 it's fine. That's fine, that's why I'm here. Um, Kalpa, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you've been, go you had been going to Gota Gogama, the protest encampment, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what you've been seeing and, you know, just take us through that sort of ground up perspective. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all the comrades at the New School for organizing this. It's uh, 5 a.m. in the morning in Sri Lanka, so I couldn't sleep. Uh, so what I'm planning to do is uh, reading out something that I have uh, written. Um, and I hope I'll be able to touch the ground reality that that actually exists uh, in in these protest sites and resistant movements. So let me read out it, uh, uh, and and I hope I'll be able to cover some some ground. Um, so um, so uh, the main objective of this very brief talk is to share a few experience of ongoing people struggle in Sri Lanka. What I'm going to share is based on the living experience through the waves of economic crisis and struggle since its beginning the first, in, in the first few weeks of March and April. Uh, some people call this struggle the April uprising, which connects us back to the history of struggles in Sri Lanka. April as a month connects, connects us to the youth uprisings in April 1971. May as a month connects us to the military defeat of Tamil liberation struggle in Sri Lanka. So these two months are actually highly significant to the uh, political struggles in, in the Sri Lankan history. Um, how history will identify the present uprising is still an open question. Because on one hand, Sri Lanka is, is still sinking into a deepening economic crisis, which shamelessly camouflaged by the typical bourgeois party politics and reshuffling of cabinet ministerial Positions. If you have uh, seen the news increase, like within the last two two days, actually, these things are happening. The political uh, authorities, especially the president and the prime minister, uh, they are doing the tricks and they are trying to fix the issue at the top layer of the political hierarchy. It seems nothing is working. And on the other hand, the struggle is still more than alive. Uh, some people assume that with the appointment of the new Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, things can, um, things can go wrong, things can 
come to a sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, stop. But I think it's still going on. The struggle is still going on. People on the street organizing themselves and talking about strategies, especially the student movement in Sri Lanka, are pre preparing themselves to the to encounter the latest strategies of the government. The latest move by the president and his family and crony capitalist around him is appointing Ranil Vikramasinghe as a prime minister. It is well challenged by the protesters, trade unions, student movement, and the majority of the civil society in Sri Lanka. Therefore, I want to emphasize that what we are seeing is an ongoing people's struggle, demanding a qualitatively different society. Unfortunately, equally undermined by the state media in Sri Lanka, and at the same time, the mainstream media in the West, I don't think media in the, in the US actually interested in, this, in the current struggle. I don't know how many media actually able to show some, uh, give some idea about the ongoing struggle in Sri Lanka. However, I will share my thoughts in four main sections. And sincerely, I hope it will help you to understand the anatomy and direction of this struggle at the present. First, I would like to discuss a little bit about the worst economic crisis uh, in the modern history of Sri Lanka. At least I'm trying to highlight how people brought themselves to the struggle under, under the worsening conditions of their material life. I'm seeing it as a process triggered by uh, wrong economic policies and the government's continuous process of undermining the depth of the real cause of the crisis. The existing crisis resurfaced the worst structural issue of the economy that were, that were implanted by neoliberal capitalism. For at least a decade, the crisis was uh, camouflaged by glittering cover of foreign debt. It was always highlighted by the ruling party, especially Rajapaksha's, that debt is not a bad thing for the economy. And it is, it is much needed for an economy like Sri Lanka in order to push the economy towards development. The, objective of, the objectives of the development were laid down by the true masters of this country, especially neoclassical economists, policymakers, and research agents from financial institutions, various think tanks, and IMF and World Bank, and from various other economic agencies in the region. Economic openness is their slogan. Famous senior economists, uh, even in the time of COVID-19, published articles stating that why Sri Lanka should be an open economy. They openly claim that, uh, uh, that they got their morals from Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek. Morals of economic openness and freedom to be precise. I want to remind you that uh, as a country, we have never been able to maintain a positive and healthy trade balance since independence. When the present crisis hit Sri Lankan economy, we were dealing with a deficit of nine to eight to nine billion dollars in the trade balance, and other sources of foreign aid remittances are significantly weakening. At the same time, tourism industry, which is one of, one of the main income sources under the economic model laid out within the last two decades, is highly sensitive to the internal and external shocks, and it reached and it reached its worst numbers during the pandemic. Therefore. A depleting foreign reserves started to affect people's lives so badly. First, it, it came as a supply shock, especially the supply of oil, then obviously it created a cluster effect in the economy through the form of inflation, unemployment, and poverty. The long queues for the oil, gas, and essential goods began to appear as a common sight in your daily life, uh, especially uh, truck drivers, tuk-tuk drivers, if you're familiar with the three-wheelers. Three-wheel drivers, private bus owners, had to wait for eight to 10 hours in long queues in front of uh, gas stations for, 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 for to, to fill their vehicles. And at the same time, people had to wait in the same queues and, and at least five people so far died uh, as standing on these queues under the burning sun and with empty bellies. I told my comrades the other night when we were talking to them, that I'm, I'm putting my Marxism seriously to a test while organizing and continuously raising to question what is to be done in this situation. I'll skip a little bit of uh, this section because I feel like I should go get into the, the more, more into the uh, ground reality. Um, so uh, what's actually going on in, 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 the, 
in the in the movement in the resistance resistance movement is is a very important um, very important uh, uh, to to highlight. So I would like to uh, uh, highlight a couple of things. So one of the main criticisms that we have witnessed during the last couple of weeks regarding people's struggle, especially based in Golfes, which is the one of the main areas in Colombo, capital is the Colombo, and that's one of the main areas in Colombo, in the form of an occupying movement. So we call it occupying golf golf phase movement, is that it, it led by a group of young people who do not even understand the ABC of politics. And also some claim that it was hijacked by the Colombo-based middle class. Contrary to this popular myth, I would like to highlight that the sequence and the anatomy of the events of the struggle should be viewed concretely and dialectically. Uh, how long I have? Uh, uh... You have two minutes. Okay, I can finish. Um, so my argument is that we should view this the, the movement concretely and dialectically without jumping into conclusions. Firstly, um, as Jude also highlighted, the continuous farmer struggle way before the events in April played a major role in the current struggle. For example, it provided a sort of culture to the struggle and resistance in Sri Lanka. I actually launched, uh, it actually launched a new beginning in the history of class struggle in Sri Lanka. Farmers directly targeted Rajapaksa family and their failed economic planning that pushed them to the worst living conditions in their entire life. It created waves of protest all around the island and farmers became a symbol of destructiveness of wrong economic planning of a government for the benefit of a very few uh, number of people. Even today, farmers are still playing a significant role in the current resistance movement in both regional and urban context. Secondly, the protests took place around the residence of the president, showed the power of an unorganized events. It burst the popular myth that Rajabaksha family power cannot be challenged. Working class people like day laborers, unemployed people, delivery workers, truck drivers, three wheel drivers, and students confronted the security forces around president's uh, residence. They demanded solution for their issues, mainly economic issues. I asked the president to resign. They demanded Rajapaksas to return the money that they stole from people and demanded all Rajapaksas to resign. Within a few minutes, it became a violent clash between protesters and security forces. Even the protesters were beaten up violently. People did what they came to do uh, on that day, proving that the president's power can be challenged and there's a space to organize, to find solutions to the present crisis through the means of direct democracy. Even though these unorganized people might never thought of such thing, there was a significant uprising of social consent to organize people to participate direct democracy. Especially young people on social media supported the protesters in this area called Mirihana. Uh, it, is a, it is a place in, uh, in Sri Lanka, which actually uh, the pre president's residence is, is, uh, is located and started to organize island-wide protest. Thirdly, the Occupy movement that started on 9th of April showed a great capacity of organizing, art of resistance and political stamina against the state mechanism of lies and manipulation. It was supported by different classes of people from, beginning, from the beginning, it identified as a peaceful protest and it gained a significant amount of attention, legitimacy around the, all around the, the island. On the, on, yeah. Stop here. And then we'll wrap up. We're actually a minute over. Okay. okay. Just uh, one sentence, maybe? Sure. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a last thing, I want to highlight that uh, on April 28th, there was a general strike that actually supported by uh, the trade unions and various other uh, political movements, civil society. And it, be, it became one of the major events uh, of, the, of the ongoing resistance movement. Resistance movement. And, and, and it, it, it was identified as, as one of the major, one of the main protests that actually brought a lot of people to the, to the street, especially the working class people. And, uh, and these, these things actually happening on the ground and we have to um, identify them very carefully. And in the discussion, let's try to, to identify where the movement is actually heading uh, at, the, at the current uh, situation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kalpa. Uh, Nyanthani, why don't you uh, begin with your section? Sure. Um, 
So thank you to the organizers, uh, Simi and others for putting together, I think, um, what is a really timely event on Sri Lanka. Um, we are, I guess, still trying to process and make sense of what has been an intense week uh, for the country. Um, and as you know, Kalpa kind of also um, explained, um, which began with a brutal attack on peaceful nonviolent protesters demanding for the resignation of the Rajapaksa brothers, the president and prime minister on Monday. Um, and the violence was of course clearly instigated by Mahinda Rajapaksa, who had to resign from his post on the same day, only after triggering violent reactions in many parts of the country as well. Um, and as I think Simi mentioned, Vimukti um, who was to be part of this panel, um, a long time activist and comrade in the struggle was also uh, threatened and attacked uh, by the thugs who burned down tents and equipment and so on in Gota Gogama. Um, as far as the crisis is concerned, um, uh, there are so many things that can be said uh, about the history, about the struggle, uh, which Kalpa has captured, as well as um, you know the impact on the ground, which again Kalpa has spoken to as well. Um, so I'm going to try and limit my comments um, to um, you know how international involvement, right, particularly the interests of global capital and international players, and how they have kind of shaped <laughs> this crisis. Um, first of all, the crisis is a result of participating in the international markets. Um, Sri Lanka defaulted on its foreign debt obligations, most of which was obtained via borrowings in the capital markets. Um, they were actually uh, international sovereign bond loans. Um, the focus of the governments after the war ended in 2009 was hugely on large scale infrastructure projects. Uh, little focus was given to local job creation or investing in the agriculture sector. Um, and as Jude kind of mentioned, we are currently in a huge food shortage uh, scenario, even fearing a famine um, uh, pretty soon. Um, there is also the balance of payment crisis. Um, Sri Lanka's imports are um, higher than its exports. Uh, and this has been the case for, a, for some time, um, contributing to a huge trades balance. Uh, the foreign earnings plummeted um, for various reasons, including um, due to the um, COVID pandemic, the war, Ukraine war, and so on. Um, and there is a severe shortage of dollars to pay for essential items like oil and milk powder. Um, our foreign exchange earners um, are mostly women work workers um, who work in highly exploitative conditions mainly in three sectors, in the tea plantation sectors, garment manufacturing, uh, in the export, export processing zones, and as migrant domestic workers in abroad. Um, these changes importantly, right, in the nature of women's labor was also brought about um, through the structural adjustment programs, uh, which were implemented by the IMF along with the World Bank in the late 1970s. And so that's an important part of, of, of our history. Um, Sri Lanka was the first country in South Asia to implement liberalization and other neoliberal reforms. Um, so one of the protest slogans that we observed by workers in export processing zones uh, was for example, asking where did our hard earned dollars go? Um, so, while the economic crisis felt in all corners of the island, it is people, workers like in the free trade zone, women, urban working poor, those in the informal sector, um, and those marginalized due to their ethnic, religious caste identities and sexual orientation are the most affected. Um, the crisis eventually is felt at the household level. And again, the burden falls on women um, to continue with social production, somehow put food on the table, even when food uh, costs are skyrocketing um, and there's no cooking gas in the shops. And also while their livelihoods have been de depleted um, in the last two years, right? So the problem is also to do with Sri Lanka's participation in, in international markets. 
Now we are being told that the solution would also come from international intervention. Um, although you know the crisis has to do very much with external accounts, um, so Sri Lanka has you know reached out to the IMF, um, which is being claimed as you know the international savior uh, for assistance. Um, we know from experience how the IMF operates. The stress is always on reducing the fiscal deficit, even when the problem is you know with the external accounts. Um, and this is done by implementing austerity programs, which is often meant uh, means cuts to social security. Um, I want to stress here that Sri Lanka is already implementing aspects of the IMF program, even before signing the agreement. And this is also because sections of Sri Lanka's elites are also supportive of those measure, measures, um, almost wanting to prove, you know, to be the good exemplary child uh, for the IMF. So interest rates have been raised, the currency was floated, and a freeze in, you know, government spending um, has also been imposed. Um, so Sri Lanka has, you know, a, in its post-independence history, um, a progressive social welfare program, uh, particularly free health and free education, as, as Simi pointed out uh, in her introduction. Um, what would happen if cuts were imposed on social welfare is, uh, to an already suffering people it is a major concern, right? Um, what I think in this current context, though, is that education and health may not be the first targets. Uh, however, first attempts may be to remove some of the subsidies enjoyed by people, for example, on utilities. Um, so electricity, you know, which was subsidized, uh, may be converted to bills at market rates. Uh, there may be rollbacks on water and transport, public transport, which is also subsidized by the state. Um, However, public investments in health and education have been dismally low in the last uh, several years. And given the stresses of the pandemic um, you know, on those sectors, increase in investments are badly needed uh, to restore these sectors. Uh, however, in the current context, uh, we may not, um, that the increase in investments may not be um, likely to come about. Uh, finally, the point I want to make is also to highlight how the political fallout of the crisis is being resolved, right? Again, this raises questions about the kind of international involvement we are witnessing, particularly in the last couple of days, where and how a new prime minister was installed. Um, as mentioned before, the Rajapaksas have been completely delegitimized meets a rallying call from all sections of society um, that the family stepped down from politics altogether. Um, in this context, um, the appointment of Rani Vikram Singh, who could not even win a seat in parliament in the last elections, as prime minister raises some questions, right? We now have a neoliberal prime minister and an authoritarian president who doesn't hold any legitimacy in the eyes of the people. Um, who would this arrangement benefit? Um, and why is it that international players are willing to push uh, such an arrangement, which is actually at the detriment of democracy for Sri Lanka itself? Um, here, I think it's worthwhile to also note that the last IMF agreement was during uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe's premiership in 2016. And soon after we saw heavy borrowings in the international sovereign markets again. Um, we also saw in the previous stint of the Prime Minister in 2002, an internationalized conflict resolution model, along with the neoliberal agenda was attempted. And it actually paved the way for the Rajapaksas to capture power and hold sway until now, um, including leading to a brutal end of the war with a huge human toll. Uh, in 2009. Um, so the questions in our minds right now, is just like you know, Sri Lanka became the experimental ground in 1978, given the kind of global shifts occurring now, and as some analysts have pointed out, that perhaps Sri Lanka is just the forerunner, right, among developing countries. Um, and we might see more countries uh, defaulting on their foreign debt as you know, debt has become unsustainable. 
will it become another occasion for experimentation by international actors? You know, will Sri Lanka become that location? Uh, and if so, what form and shape will it take uh, is a question. Um, so I think I, I just want to leave with those questions. Um, and it's something I hope you know, we can discuss and deliberate on. Um, and um, I guess you know, the question is also whether rise and resistance is what we are going to see, or are we actually you know, going to see despotic rule with international in interference in Sri Lanka? Um, and I guess the jury is still, still out on this one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nanthani. Um, heavy note to end on as we transition into questions and answers. Um, before we start, I just wanted to indicate that we have, for those of you who are looking for refreshment, there is chai available with and without milk. Um, I'll take questions from the audience, you know, as they come. And We'll talk for, I don't know, I'm on uh, time period on Q&A. Time period on Q&A, how long? 20, well, for the next 20 minutes, let's delve into some of what we've heard. Uh, and please feel free to avail yourself. And I guess the way we'll do this, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll call hand the podium so our speakers can see you. Question over there. I saw you first with the pink mask. Do you want to come up to the podium? Uh, okay. Or I can field the question for you. Uh, uh, Um, the question is not audible. I think you actually have to come up here. Anyone who has questions, please go towards the mic. The questions are The people who are on our way. Our way. Can uh, can you all hear us? Okay. okay. Sorry, so sorry. <laughs> actually has to do with um, a point that Kalpa made during his presentation. Um, he mentioned that uh, the US media is not very interested in the current struggle uh, in Sri Lanka. And I was wondering, Kalpa, if you could expand on that point. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I think uh, I was uh, referring to the, the uh, I mean the coverage basically, and uh, and I don't see that. Uh, uh, obviously, I mean the U.S. media has their own agenda and interest, and I don't see that uh, still the news and other 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 media uh, events are winning the winning the attention. Um, at least I haven't seen uh, the the news and and the coverage. Um, and my follow up to that is. Um, I was wondering if you could contrast um, the current coverage by the U.S. media with their extremely intense focus, intense uh, focus on the Easter Sunday bombings three years ago. I was wondering if you see a contrast between how they, at least in my opinion, very zealously covered that event versus their relatively tepid interest in what's happening now. Yeah, it's a. I don't know how to contrast that, but I think uh, uh, it was sort of like lot number of people died, a lot of people died, and that won the attention immediately of the international media. But I, I think uh, uh, people don't understand that uh, this is a very significant moment for for our country because there 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 haven't been a movement like this, people leading a struggle like this. And I, do, I don't see that, that uh, there, there's no real interest for, 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 for media like uh, uh, in the US. They don't have the real interest to identify and focus on such movement. And I, I don't see that. So I think uh, uh, 
it came up in a couple of uh, media channels, especially in the UK, after a couple of people died during the last, during uh, the attack on 9th of, of May. So it seems that they need that kind of uh, event that actually actually signified by a couple of deaths. And until that, they don't, they don't see the significance of such, such events. That's very unfortunate. Yes. Um, does any, did, would anybody else want to weigh in on that? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Um, my sense, I mean, I haven't uh, looked at how much coverage there has been in uh, the internet, in, in the media, uh, but my sense is that um, at least in the last few weeks, uh, that there's heightened interest in Sri Lanka and uh, how much of that is, is in, in relation to what's going on in the global economy, the shifts that we are seeing um, in terms of, you know, uh, questions around uh, foreign debt of developing countries, questions around um, inflation, food security, and so on. Um, it's, it seems like some of those issues are resonating um, because of concerns, you know, about how that's, you know, it's going to evolve in other places as well. Um, and that's been, you know, something we've been wondering about as well. Um, what would be like the, the global reaction to the changes that we are seeing in the economy? And if there's any hope uh, in, in a different approach to even addressing um, Sri Lanka's economic crisis. Um, because um, as, as I also mentioned, there's, there's very little room for negotiation with, with the IMF. Um, we are already in that in that program and in that trajectory. Um, and if there would be kind of any kind of global shift in, in, you know, in the thinking about how to address um, the economic crisis, uh, whether we, you know, we would also see something happen uh, differently in Sri Lanka is it's something that you know, we would be interested to see. Yeah, I think uh, I have been following some of the coverage. In, there's one in New York Times and there's LA and UK. It's very interesting. They follow the same regular pattern. All these narratives, the Western narratives, are basically expressed in terms of good governance and people suffering, very disembodied language of good governance. And then what it does is basically repeat the same very familiar argument, right? If you get your politics right, everything will be fine, right? So I think so the, by doing that, they are completely sort of playing into this whole narrative that there's emerging narrative now, the crisis that is happening now, what we need to focus on is this tension between uh, between uh, Rani Lukram Singh and Rajapakshas. But as uh, Niantari basically said, no, it's a, there's no tension really. It's a perfect match. Autocratic ruler and a, and a, and a neoliberal prime minister who, who gives his appearance as a Democrat, as a good governance, champion of good governance, right? But actually what they are doing is typical example of governmentality, right? Um, they are basically disciplining the public to function according to the neoliberal interest. So I have, I was told, I don't know if Kalpa can uh, try to verify, uh, I was told that the, some people already have left the, uh, the protest centers and they happen to be the ones who are very happy with uh, Vikram Singh. Right? That's true. That's true. So you, so you can see that like the Western coverage is basically, it's, it's a very moralistic language, isn't it? I, mean, I think you guys know this. I don't have to explain my language. It completely sort of give them even more room for for the IMF and all these. As Niyanti was saying, that IMF has got far more leverage and opportunities and power than any other time in the history. So uh, I mean, that's the most scary part. And then Niyanti was absolutely correct. These reforms are happening way before that. The idea that Sri Lanka has to get their act together and then go to IMF. IMF is waiting. That's all rubbish. This, this, this guy has been going on for a long time. And mm -hmm. also this one of the things I think we have to tell the people those who don't read this stuff is also to make the point that IMF is not really a lending agency. We really need to educate the public on what this institution is all about. Idea that actually 
they are not there to give it, I mean, not that we want them, actually, IMF want us, right? I mean, that we have to shift the discourse, right? I would like to open to other questions. Is anybody else? Is there a hand in the audience? Yes, do you want to come on up? Oh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the conversation. Uh, my name is Maham. Hi, Kalpa. Uh, Kalpa and I are friends. I hope you're well. Um, so I have a question um, both for you, Jude, and for you, Kalpa. Jude, you were talking at one point about the connection between agriculture. Can you hear me? We lost I, you for a while. I lost connection after you. Okay, I'll just repeat myself. Okay, so um, Jude, you were talking about the connection between the enforced switch to organic um, agriculture and the protests. So um, I think you were cut off at one point, and I'd appreciate it if you could, you know, talk a little bit more about what how that connection manifests itself. And for Kalpa, you know, the movement, like you described uh, it. Uh, seems like a movement for uh, a change in material conditions and to what extent is the movement addressing you know some of the cleavages around caste and uh, religion that you also uh, spoke about earlier so i uh, would appreciate a little bit more conversation around that yeah thanks yeah to put it briefly the the reason for the transition to organic farming was driven by the neoliberal interest of converting the Sri Lankan agriculture into to be, so that it will be profitable in the international market. So that generated a series of crises, and one among them is food security issue and the uh, the, the drop in farmers' income, and that affected everybody. In the so one of the main reasons behind the protest is this economic hardships. And it also has shown that people can organize themselves despite the economic hardships. And that, that's another positive part. The two things happen. So these two are deeply connected. And that was a real trigger. At the end of the day, you know, the, our relationship with land is fundamental to everything that happened. Right? So, the, 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 so the, we don't see the role of capital, neoliberal interest, when we when we don't when we look at the uh, neoliberal uh, sorry the organic farming outside the context of global capitalism you don't see that right this is ideology organic language is ideally very seductive language right how can you oppose right? i think if you is see the kind of changes that happen and the protest food crisis right very simple example and i think i can connect that with what was going on in farmers protests in india in a different way in a different different process, but again, the substance is the same. Uh, Mom, if I'm answering to, to your question, and it's wonderful to see you, uh, and uh, answering to your question, I think uh, the resistance movement, and I, I don't think like you can have a unique, like, you know, um, how to say that? It's, there's no unique uh, set of demands, I would say. There are three main demands, president and prime minister to go home, Rajapaksas to go home and return the money that is stole. And then there should be a constitutional amendment. These are the three, three demands. But these are the popular demands I would call. Uh, but there are movements, there are especially the student movement in Sri Lanka, they have much more fundamental demands that actually goes down, goes deeper into the, the material conditions of life in Australia, life uh, of life and especially the the uh, their demands on stru structural changes in the economy and especially a change in the mode of production especially in, in farming <clears throat> in agriculture in production and especially as as Niyanti correctly mentioned uh, we depend on female labor our economy is completely depend on female labor and there should be a significant change in that and the workers, female, female laborers actually correctly asked, raised the question, what happened to the dollars that we, that we earned throughout the last three, three to four decades? These are real authentic questions. And there are demands from such movements, but, but I can't like generalize. 
homogenize uh, the demands to to change the material conditions of life and also there's no significant demands to 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 abolish like like abolish caste and religious uh, uh, differences um, there are like like symbolic values like if, if you I, I have seen that on social media a lot of people share uh, priests monks and 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 uh, islamic uh, um, teachers they are they are sitting together discussing together but there's no significant i, I don't see there's a significant uh, collaboration those sort of reconciliation um, going on uh, there are contradictions that's the most important thing i want to highlight this moment is highly contradictory and there are conflicts and we have to identify them and and my whole concern is that uh, i mean since the beginning we observed that there are people who would say completely yes to IMF, like more than 60% at the protest site in Colombo would say yes to IMF. Only 40% would take a chance and say no. And also at the same time, there are highly racist people in the protest at the protest sites. But it, it, it's a contradictory collaboration. So it's it's a very open, open process, still a very open process. And also as, as Jude correctly said, a lot of people went and met uh, Rani Vikramasinghe and basically presented their program, presented their proposal. And it's a very disappointing, uh, uh, to be honest. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for this forum. My name is Don. Um, Neanthony, you mentioned that, um, uh, uh, mentioned a couple of different things, uh, in particular, that uh, the current situation is a forerunner uh, to debt crises uh, that are currently beginning, of course, starting in Sri Lanka. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. An observation that I, that I think many can make is that, um, there have been so many debt crises in the past, over the decades in different parts of the world, among less developed countries, and it's more of a feature than a bug in our, in our economic system. And um, when you talked about a global shift, um, I wonder what gives you hope in terms of seeing that transformation? Uh, what might break this cycle that keeps happening again and again? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. It's, a, it's an important one. Um, I must say that um, I don't have a complete answer to that. I've seen uh, people who study the IMF much more closely, including economists like Jayati Ghosh, um, kind of point to um, the, the fact that uh, foreign debt in many of the developing countries have become unsustainable now. Um, and we saw, you know, even concerns from the IMF at the beginning of the pandemic, for example, uh, where they, you know, they kind of said, you know, we need uh, to stimulate economies. Um, they, you know, they kind of, uh, kind of indicated a shift, but it does seem that now they're going back on, on that. Uh, if you look at um, the IMF report that was submitted uh, to Sri Lanka, we kind of see the same formulas. There's, there's really um, no big shift. Um, I know there is the, the kind of uh, discourse which um, tries to say that the IMF is no longer the monster um, that it was before. Um, that you know we can think of it more as a you know um, a, a less you know lesser evil. Um, but um, as you know as mentioned before, like we are already in this IMF process even before Sri Lanka went and goes and signs the agreement. Um, and since we have defaulted on the loan, you know, we, we have to now uh, negotiate with creditors and try to um, restructure the debt. And that has been one of the IMF conditions. Um, the other aspect, of course, is that, you know, this is also politically driven. Um, so in the coming weeks and months, a question would be that 
would we see um, some uh, capital flowing in? Would we see some assistance flowing in given the appointment of, of the new prime minister um, as well? Uh, would we see some gestures from the West? Um, and, you know, uh, would we even see like, you know, one of the questions was about, um, uh, you know, uh, immediate financing, right? Um, rapid financing to address food, you know, the food shortages, the fuel shortages. Um, and so it's it's all very political um, um, and the political dynamics is something that uh, we might uh, want to watch for. Um, and of course, I, I guess the hope is of course, you know, that there, hopefully there'll be more global solidarity emerging, um, thinking about, you know, in terms of the global shifts. Uh, but the hope has always been, and as Kalpa has, you know, also explained, it's it's the protests on the ground. Like we would never have thought two years ago that the Rajapaksas would be um, um, shaken in this way, and, and and the prime minister, you know, the former prime minister, not even being able to face the public right now, right, um, by his own constituencies, by all kinds of different sections of society, and all of that was achieved. Uh, by the protesters, you know, democratic protesters on the ground. Um, and it's it's a long struggle. Um, it, it was, I mean, Gota Go Gamma was, you know, the culmination of that struggle. And, you know, but various other um, groups have been protesting. Um, in the last year, we saw that the fear of, you know, that people had about the Rajapaksa regime kind of crumble. Um, it started with jokes and, you know, memes and um, hume, you know, um, jokes about the regime and so on. But uh, there have also, you know, as, as mentioned, farmers protests and trade union pro protests. One of the struggles, uh, major struggles last year was by uh, school teachers um, who went on strike and they actually won their demands. Um, as well. And so it's been this kind of long process of struggle by various groups, including people in the North and East, um, over, you know, um, questions around accountability for the disappeared, about land issues, demilitarization, um, on microfinance loans, you know, women's groups um, protested and, and farmers groups. Um, so there's been, you know, various forms of protest that have kind of brought us and kind of shaken um, the, the regime we thought, you know, we might be stuck with forever. Uh, and there's no way, I think, for them to um, stay on. Um, so the question, the other question is also about for how long the president and the prime minister can continue. Uh, in, in their position and how much political stability is possible if austerity measures are uh, implemented. Um, and so there'll be lots of changes that I feel. Um, and so there's still lots of, you know, more, there's, there's hope um, for us, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Would any of the um, other panelists like to reply? Okay, just to go example for examples of what uh, Niantini was saying. If you look at, read the news last couple of days, what people are celebrating. Value of the dollar is getting better. Exchange rate is getting better. Money is coming in, flowing in. Uh, Prime Minister is negotiating with the international donors, right? So you can see that what the, it's a political discourse, right? How, we, how it's shaping. But what I'm hopeful is that, and things are happening on the ground, this crisis will lead to alternative ways of organizing agriculture, fisheries, and things like that. And then talk to Ireland, the cooperative work that Ireland is doing, right? It's very consistent with the way uh, movements in the US, like food justice movement, for sovereignty movement, abolitionist movement. I think this will also, if we, if we can sort of, if, if the protests can be channeled into alternative ways of organizing production and distribution, however small they are, I think that's a positive outcome. Is it happening? Yes. And who is running most of this project? Women. I have uh, I have been collecting data who is running these small uh, agriculture projects and fisheries projects, right? So I think that's a positive outcome. Can we replicate a large scale? That's where I think our organizing efforts has to be. Thank you. Um, I think a few more. Um, I've seen a hand surfacing a couple of times over there. Would you like to come up? Yeah. 
Uh, do you want to be on camera? Or? Uh, sure, sure. Hi, I'm a mega thought. Hi, Kelpa. Um, very thought provoking presentation. Doing a few questions. I just wanted to bring it up one more time. Um, we're speaking about how this particular crisis is affecting, has a, has a significant impact on women. I want to know um, how women's voices are being centered in. in, in Um, in the current kind of struggle. Does that make sense? I guess it's mostly for Nyang and me. Um, yeah, and I guess Kalpa, uh, because you're on the ground, might be able to also answer to that. Um, <clears throat> the, the way in which, you know, the, the crisis is affecting women, of course, is that, you know, all of this eventually, um, you know, impacts the household. Um, and um, for a long time, um, in addition to, you know, women being the, the biggest contributors to the economy, their um, unpaid care work um, is also not valued or it's, it's invisibilized um, to um, in our economy. Um, and um, some of the provisions that uh, we had in Sri Lanka, like, um, like social security networks, like Samurdi, you know, which is one of the uh, main programs um, for um, low-income households. You know, there's a cash transfer, um, and given that you know a lot of the women are also employed in, in the informal sector, where they rely on daily wage labor um, in the plantation, um, tea plantation, and so on, um, where you know they are deprived of, of a lot of basic facilities. They do not own land. Uh, they live in line housing. Um, and they have had their long kind of struggle for um, to win over a thousand rupee, you know, basic wage. Uh, and a lot of the time, the, the collective bargaining agreements are um, often not uh, respected, right? So it's in these conditions that women have were already kind of um, working and, and uh, making a living and, and looking after, um, you know, family members, looking after children, um, looking into their education and so on. Um, when the pandemic hit, hit um, it had an impact on um, women who were working abroad as domestic labor. Many of them returned back to their villages. Um, women who were employed in factories, um, some of them lost their jobs and they had to go back to the villages. Some of them started, uh, those who had, you know, small plots of land, even, you know, those who were not cultivating, tried to start cultivating um, in that period because you know, there was no other option, right? Um, and then everything that Jude has been uh, explaining, right, in terms of the fertilizer ban and so on, um, is, is also impacting, you know, traditional farmers in, in, in major ways. Um, and it is in the middle of all that now, you know, they have to deal with the economic crisis. So the, the impact is really acute. Um, we don't have the full picture of, of the impact, but anecdotal evidence, you know, you, you know, if we go by anecdotal evidence and the stories that we hear from the women's groups that we work with, um, we already know there are huge concerns about nutrition. Uh, people have cut down on, on the meals. Um, that they have the portion, you know, that they eat. Um, <clears throat> very often, girl, girl children um, are impacted by that um, as well. Um, we have seen some doctors talk about um, the loss of weight uh, in, in pregnant mothers. Um, and so these are long consequences, right? Nutrition in relation to education for children, you know, and, and the outcomes for education in the long run. Um, are uh, all kind of concerns that you know women are currently grappling with. Um, um, there is very little consultation with women. Um, um, there is, uh, although women have been a major part of the protests at, at every level, um, they have uh, they have come out and <clears throat> shown their support in the protests. Um, a statement that was issued by um, some feminist organizations. Um, put out eight proposals um, 
which was recently kind of endorsed by the UN representative for uh, food as well. And in those eight proposals, they had outlined, you know, ensuring a food distribution system, making sure essential items are distributed by the state at uh, affordable cost is one of the major, major demands uh, that they put forward. Um, they had also asked that the government find the revenues um, through um, direct taxation. Sri Lanka has a skewed you know, taxation system, uh, almost 80% or more is, is through indirect taxes. Um, and so the demand was to you know, look for ways to increase government revenues through uh, wealth taxes. Um, so they can you know, make sure that the basics for you know, food uh, security are, are ensured. Um, they had also said in, in, in that statement, um, and actually I was also a part of that, that collective, um, that women should be consulted. Um, and there's a you know, big debate um, very often among a lot of the think tanks, economic think tanks, and those who have you know, claimed to be the experts. Uh, and many of them you know, um, you know, come with, with a neoliberal um, kind of economic framework, often trying to shut down others from, from speaking. You know? uh, but uh, people have been on the streets and are constantly demanding for various things. And, and um, particularly in terms of you know, the economic kind of uh, policies that, uh, you know, like this group and others, they have been kind of demanding for various things, uh, which are not really taken seriously. Right, um, but I guess it's through the the, the protests, uh, particularly you know the trade unions, as as Kalpa mentioned, it it was a general strike, uh, and in Sri Lanka's history that was also significant because the last big general strike that we had was in the Great Hatal in 1953, uh, and that was that was because foods um, agriculture subsidies were cut to farmers, and and so it's only now that we are seeing this. Uh, general strikes happening. So um, I think there is, you know, that's that's the hope as well, right? And hopefully in, 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 the, in the trade union movement, um, women's voices also um, can be more amplified, I feel. Kalpa, I'm just wondering uh, whether you observed something that I've been observing, but I don't have enough evidence to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, is there a tendency on the media to, to really focus on men in this protest? Because I hear about the motivation of Apache, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stories I hear. So I think I see more men's voices uh, than women's voices. I, I see that that's going on. The other point is that when we say, of course, there's a lot new about the movie. But I think Sometimes we might not recognize the same elements in the previous movements because of the intellectual frameworks that we used to assess them. For example, role of women. Women were very much present in the labor movement, but we didn't see them because we had a very masculinized or patriarchal uh, kind of uh, lenses through which we assess the labor movement. What we consider labor was a labor for which it was paid, not the women's unpaid labor. And they were also pretty much part of the movements, right? But they are there. They were not seen. They were invisible because the framework. Not that they were not there. Yes. So I think while it is important for us to sort of identify what is new in the movement, but we also need to sort of sort of think about the continuities that we yeah. don't see because of the framework that we used to assess the past. Yeah. I mean that said, I just pull out one of the interviews in response to one of the questions. Right. The <laughs> the one interview, one of the, I asked uh, some farmers in uh, Andhradapur, how come after the organic thing started, how come that most of women are doing it, not you? They gave a very classic example. You know, most of the organic stuff uh, women use, we use in the field, they are from the kitchen and women cook. So she can do better in the organic farming. Yes. But now she's doing according to the dictates of the organic companies, which are coordinated by the John Kills, right? Mm -hmm. It's very really interesting how whole this project is feminized in very subtle ways, right? Absolutely. So, so I think yeah, if I'm answering uh, the first question, I think yes, uh, the, the male characters, um, like people like uh, this uh, motivation of Pachi, it's, it's a character, it's a very popular character in this, in the movement. Uh, now I think he's out, people pushed him uh, away, chased him away, 
for various reasons. Um, yes, I think uh, uh, men's voices are highlighted and they were focused. But I think for the second question, like uh, the role of women, I think they built a sort of autonomy and you don't need men's voices to, within the movement, you don't need men's voices to, to have a sort of, have a sort of voice for, for themselves. They do what they do. And I, I wanted to highlight that uh, for, the, for, the, for the question that Mega raised uh, previously, that there's a really elegant division of labor in the resistance movement. It's so beautiful. And if you, if you look at carefully, I try to capture some of the aspects in my photographs that it's so elegant and we can learn a lot of things without actually using our old frameworks to, to understand the resistance, the resistance movement. Because I think the old lefties failed in Sri Lanka. They, they don't have any say in the movement. And, and the kind of, uh, uh, kind of norms that they had to understand a movement, the kind of strategies that they had to, to understand a movement like this, it all, they both failed actually. So I think we had to use really creative new values to understand what are the significant characters of, of the current movement and the role of women in, in that. So I think uh, uh, it's a very, it would be a very interesting study to, to do that. What kind of things females are doing within the moment. Um, and there's no hierarchy. That's very important. There's no hierarchy. People, people tend to do whatever they can. And then they, they tend to do uh, uh, everything they can some, at, at some, in some occasions. So it's a very elegant mixture of division of division of labor. Um, yeah. We're ready to transition into the next phase of our program. Um, thank you to our guests. Thank you to everyone who attended.